All right, one more time. If you're excited for Christmas season, you're happy to be here on a Sunday morning, come on, put your hands together, make a little bit of noise, get our blood flowing and our hearts open and expectant. Hey, as we get started today, I just wanted to look back one week and say thank you. Uh, Last Sunday was our uh, legacy offering. It's our special year-end giving that we do, and uh, we uh, find strategic ways in which we can be a part of echoing God's love far beyond these walls whether it be international missions, whether it be national church planning, whether it's giving here locally to organizations that are helping those that are hurting and hungry or facing homelessness and uh, different initiatives that we have in the year ahead as a church. Uh, The Legacy Offering is all a part of that. And I want to say a couple of things. Number one, thank you. We have an incredibly generous church. One of the goals we had was uh, for 50 to 60 board games we brought so we could donate those to the uh, Mary Lee Mayer Food Pantry that's uh, run out of Avon Schools, and we wanted to bless them as part of our partnership uh, here in the school with them, and uh, you all brought 68 board games, and so well done with that. Come on, well done with that. We had a lot of fun delivering those this week, and they're just so blessed by it, and they're going to have a home for every single one of those, so thank you guys. Also wanted to say just thanks for your generosity on the whole, one of the other goals we had was just for uh, uh, complete participation. We just said across the board, we're not looking at a specific amount. Let's just all be on board together to echo God's love far beyond these walls. And so many of you gave, and you gave generously. And I just want to say thank you. We have an incredibly generous church. Come on, one more time. We just like, our church is wonderful. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm extremely grateful to be your pastor. I'm so thankful for your generosity and ways that we get to echo God's love beyond here. Uh, Several people have asked, so I just want to let you know the legacy offering is still open. It's still available. If you'd still like to give uh, over the next couple of weeks, you may do so. We'll we'll end it at the end of the year, but it'll be open for a couple more weeks. I want to encourage you, if you didn't get to utilize one of these last week, please do so. They're in your worship guide, and uh, even if you gave online, I just want to encourage you, let us know what you're thanking God for in 2019. What are you praying for in 2020? We would be honored to pray right alongside of you, okay? I want to encourage you with that. And we'll be sharing over the next few weeks how we're able to utilize that legacy offering to, to partner with some great organizations, okay? I'll be sharing all that with you in uh, the coming, coming weeks. Today, we are in the second part of a series called Travel Light, Travel Light. And as much as we love the holidays, uh, all of the extra planning and purchasing and partying can really increase anxiety, especially when you're already walking into the holidays with a little bit of baggage. You know what I'm saying? You got a little bit of stuff that you're bringing from uh, past relationships or some of those family things that are going on. There may be some hurt from something that's happening at work or in the house. And all of the extra stuff, which is anxiety-inducing on its own, all pulled together can make you feel burdened during the holidays and not joyful, right? Last week, we talked about the power of surrendering control to God. And I think it was freeing for so many people. I had you uh, repeat uh, some things out loud to one another. I, I said this, we're a participatory church, and I preach better when you talk back at me, and you learn better when you're talking as well. That's why we do this. And so I had you say uh, two phrases. One of them was this. It was simply, let it go. And I said in your best frozen voice, belt it out. Look at somebody right now and say, let it go. It's okay. Let it go. Let it go, all right? Then we also, uh, we were singing a little bit of the Beatles last week, and it was uh, let it be, let it be. Look at somebody and say, let it be, let it be, let it be, all right? This week we're going to be talking about dropping the weight of your past, the, dropping some of the, the weight of the baggage from your past. And so I need you to find somebody around you, and you got to say this to them, all right? Find somebody around you, I need you to say this, you need to lose some weight. Go ahead. It's fine. They're going to love you for it because you're just telling them the truth. You're just loving on them. Listen, I'm just, I'm just talking about your past. It has nothing to do with your, don't, don't take this the wrong way, all right? We're going to lose some weight today. Everybody said? That was your amen spot right there. We're going to like, come on, come on. My goal in this series is to help you live into the fullness of the holiday season and We're going to leave behind some baggage and discover the joy of traveling light, the joy of traveling light. If you're new around here, I I love to travel. I've talked about that uh, often. Some of my best stories come out of traveling. It's my hobby. I I stock up on travel points, and we save money so we can travel as a family. I love to travel. But what you might not know about me 
is I don't just love traveling, like going somewhere and exploring somewhere new, but I love like thinking about traveling. <laughs> I love planning for traveling. I love learning about traveling. I read travel books, all right? You can make fun of me if you want. I even enjoy the packing process. Come on, somebody. Like, it's, it's an illness. It's not, it's not, it's not right. But uh, any, anybody, like, you know, like, anybody, like, when you travel, like, you're bringing, like, the whole closet. You know what I'm saying? Like, you're bringing, it takes you days. It takes, it takes you, don't, don't point, all right? Don't point. It takes you days to, uh, to pack. And uh, travel experts, because again, I, I, read, I read a lot of books and I watch a lot of things on travel. Travel experts will say there's two types of travelers. They, all of us can fit into one or two of these categories. There are those that travel light, and then there's everybody else that wishes they knew how to travel light. <laughs> right, those, two, those two different categories. And travel experts will also say that the joy you experience in the journey of traveling is decreased with every extra bag that you bring. <laughs> And if you don't know what I'm talking about, right, just picture yourself standing, you know, at the ticket counter at the airport and you're holding all of the stuff. I, I wish that I could say that I went and had some people bring some luggage and uh, I had a great illustration and just to borrow it, but all of this just came out of my closet last night. <laughs> like this is our this is our baggage and then when the kids start getting into it, right, they start bringing their, their stuff uh, along and... Uh, we've had this one since we we got married. We 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 know how to we know how to travel, and we we bring all of this baggage along. And come on, who knows? Like I'm really excited when we get to the ticket counter, and I can just like throw all of this like at the person. You know, I'm like, you just take it. I don't want to see it till I get. Well, I don't even care if I ever see it again. And then when we had little ones, we had to get this big thing here because what we would do is we would actually put like pack and plays in this thing. You know what I'm talking about? Like you know, portable you know cribs. And then we would also bring, like, portable high chairs. <laughs> and we would, I mean, like, diapers and wipes and food and, like, the, the whole thing. And we decided that one really big bag wasn't enough. We needed another one, you know, because, like, we're a family of five. And we've just got to have all the stuff. And so then we show up at the ticket counter. Now, we've been dropped off by ground transport. And I'm just like, this, this is going to be a great trip. This is going to be fantastic. I can't, I can't. Can't wait. It's going to be wonderful. And I throw it all at the ticket agent, and we run, and I really don't even care if it shows up at our destination. And, you know, because the airports are wonderful, it always shows up. It always comes on the conveyor belt, and then we pick it up, and then we get it all. And then I'm like, how do we, what do we, I don't even know where to begin. We throw it all into whatever is taking us to our hotel. We get to the hotel. We walk up the, you know, the, the, the stairs, or we go up the elevator, whatever it might be. We get into the room, and I'm like, I'm regretting even taking this trip. This is not Fun. Come on, somebody. You know what I'm talking about? Like, if you've traveled with kids, you know exactly what it is that I'm talking about. We got some baggage that we bring along for the journey. Some baggage we bring along for the journey. Well, this past March, Katie and I were taking a little trip, and I'm a little out of breath with all this, all this baggage. Katie and I were taking a trip, and we decided that we were going to put this theory to the test of traveling light. We were actually going to Washington, D.C., and we were flying into the Baltimore airport, and we were going to take the train down. So we said, let's travel as light as we possibly can. We're only taking the train all around the city, and we're not going to travel heavy. We're going to travel light. So we left all that at home, <laughs> and we just put what we needed in this little bag, and Katie had one for herself. Yes, ladies, Katie had one bag, and she made it. She's still here. She's alive. Like It's a, it's a miracle. And it was just so joyful. <laughs> we showed up at Union Station in uh, D.C. And we were looking around at all these people who were walking around with this stuff. And we're like, what poor souls. <laughs> who would ever travel like that? That's the most ridiculous thing ever. Like, this is a new way to, it's a new way to travel. It's become a part of who we are and what we do. It's transpired into different parts of our life where we're just we're throwing stuff out and giving stuff away. Like, we're just learning to travel light in life. And when Ava and I, my oldest, we went back to D.C. in May, we did a very similar trip, and it was just me and Ava, and she got one of these bags, and we even, like, took stuff out of it so that, you know, she could, she could have it as well, and we were just traveling light. Have you ever experienced the, the joy of traveling light? Now I'm not talking about travel anymore, by the way. <laughs> but in life, have, have you experienced the joy of, of traveling light? Are you, are, you, are you walking along bringing some, some baggage and some weight with you in the journey? Have you noticed that we're not very good in life about 
letting the past stay in the past. We kind of like to bring the hurts right along with us. I want to ask you today, how much weight, how much baggage are you carrying around? How much of your past are you bringing into the present and it's actually robbing you of a future? How much of it are you lugging around and you look, come on, let's be honest, this is as ridiculous as I did just a moment ago. The joy you're experiencing in the journey is decreased with every baggage from the past that you choose to bring along. It's weighing you down. It's slowing you down. It's, it's hindering where you can go and what you can do in life. And so often we allow ourselves to be defined by our mistakes. We wear these labels that we are never meant to put on. You fell into temptation. You let your guard down. You didn't handle the situation right. You had a moment. You had a, a season. Or maybe it was longer than a season. And now you're not proud of what you did or how long you stayed in that season. You keep replaying the divorce. You keep fretting over that business failure. Maybe you look back on the way you raised your children and you have some regrets. Maybe you're battling an addiction. You've compromised your values. Whatever it may be, it's a weight that you're still carrying around. And with every holiday party you go to, right, the people that know you best, they also know your past. And it just allows you to replay it over and over again in your mind. It reminds me of a story of uh, the Apostle Peter back in the New Testament. He's one of Jesus' closest followers. If you know anything about Peter, he's constantly zealous and he's ambitious and he wants to do great things. In fact, he did do great things for Jesus until the day that he didn't. In fact, the worst moment of his life was the night that Jesus was arrested. Before Jesus was to be arrested, Jesus told Peter, you're going to deny me three times. Now, if you know anything about Peter, that's a, that's a crazy thing to say to him in terms of what he believes. Like, no, like I've, I've abandoned everything, Jesus, to follow you. I will never deny you. It doesn't matter what the situation is going to be. But he didn't know what Jesus was about to walk through. But then he encounters it. And here's what the scripture says. Peter was following so closely, he denied him three times. And then it says this in Luke 22, And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. This is how closely he was following Jesus has been arrested. He's been mocked and beaten and ridiculed. Peter's following closely and watching it all. People keep saying, do you know that guy? No, I don't know the guy. Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And it says this, he went out and wept bitterly. He went out and wept bitterly. I think a lot of us, if not all of us, can relate to Peter in one way or another in our lives. We've had these moments where even if not on the outside, on the inside, we were weeping bitterly over a decision that we made, a choice that we, that we, that we let, walked into, a, a season that came because of the choices that we had made. We weren't proud of what came about because of it. We were disappointed. We were dissatisfied with what we did. But I want you to hear today that our decisions, our choices, and our past, listen to me, they are not the end of the story. They're just a part of the story. It's not where you're going. It's not what God has written for you. It's just a part of where you're going. In fact, one big thought for the day, I want to encourage you to grab out your message notes. If you're taking notes on the Echo app, you can grab those out as well. I want to encourage you to follow along and I'll help you as we're journeying together. One big thought is simply this. You can't change your past, but God can change your future. You can't change what's happened. But if you allow God into your journey, God can change your future. In fact, he's got so much hope waiting for you. It can start today. God has a new beginning waiting, ready for you. You are not your worst moments. You are not defined by your mistakes. The Bible says that your enemy is actually called the accuser, and he wants to accuse you. He wants to say you are what you did, but you're, you are not what you did in Jesus, you are what he did. <laughs> and that means you're forgiven and you're loved and there's grace and there's hope. You are what he did. God still has a destiny for you. Somebody needs to hear this today. You are not too far gone. It doesn't matter what you've done. God still has a future for you. You are not your failure. 
doesn't matter what aunt so-and-so says about you. doesn't matter what cousin so-and-so thinks about you. Listen to me. God has a plan for your life, and it's far too big for you to stay stuck in your past. God has so much waiting and ready on the journey ahead. Today, it's time to travel light. If you can't change the past, stop bringing it along with you. But if you allow God, he can change your future. With our time together, what I want to do is I want to share some important truths to expound on this idea of allowing God to change our future. If you're struggling with your past, I think you're going to be encouraged by some of the people in the Bible, real people that struggle with real things just like you and me, and they had some difficulty getting over their past. The first truth is this. Don't allow your past mistakes to limit your future capacity. Don't allow your past mistakes to limit your future capacity. I I think about uh, Thomas in the New Testament. Most of us know Thomas with there's always an adjective right before his name. Some of you know what I'm talking about. It's doubting Thomas, right? There's this moment after Jesus has been resurrected, which how many times have you been around when someone's been resurrected? Come on. (laughs) And everybody's talking. We think Jesus, like we went to his tomb, he wasn't there, and and Thomas is like, listen, something else is up. Like, and that's probably what most of us would have thought. Like, somebody stole him. Like, he's not, he did not resurrect from the dead. That's never happened. That can't be it. And he says these words, unless I see him with my eyes, unless I, I put my hands where his scars are, I'm not going to believe. And then Jesus comes into his presence, and he sees him, and he sees the scars. Most people forget what came next, and that's that Thomas said, my Lord and We just remember that he was doubting Thomas. (laughs) That's how we still refer to him today. Most everyone doesn't know that in time he would actually, uh, church history would record, he would go and take the gospel further than any other of the original church fathers. He would end up preaching and starting churches in present-day India. To this day, Christians, when they have sons, will often name their sons Thomas, looking back 2,000 years ago to that very first church planner who came into their community and was preaching the name of Jesus. When God looks at Thomas, he doesn't call him Doubting Thomas. <laughs> he calls him Believing Thomas. He calls him a Changed Thomas, Disciple Thomas, Church Starting Thomas, Anointed Thomas. So often we look back at our past and say it's going to limit our future capacity. And I want us to stop thinking about that today. We need to continue looking at people like Moses. Think about his story for a moment. He, he knew from an early age that God had a call on his life. The problem was that he jumped God's plan. He jumps God's story. Some of you, you know it. He was walking along one day and he sees one of his Israelite brothers uh, being beaten viciously by an Egyptian guard. And he, he jumps to the defense of his, uh, of his kinsmen and in the process he kills the Egyptian. Well, what's he going to do? He, he finds himself as a fugitive on the run, and he goes as far away as he possibly can. He starts over with a new life, and this dream, this call that he thought he had was all but forgotten. There's no more dreams. There's no more hope. He just kind of has this pastoral life taking care of sheep. Until one day, 40 years later, 40 years later, God finds him. Now, we know the, the burning bush story because his call was irrevocable. Do you know that? Regardless of what you've done, however you've gotten off your journey, the call of God on your life is irrevocable as well. He actually then sends Moses back, you know the story, to save his people, to bring them out, lead them into the promised land. God still has a call on your life. Regardless of what your past has said about you, regardless of what you've done, regardless of what has happened to you, God's call on you is irrevocable. It doesn't matter what you did. It does not qualify you. We say it this way, the better way. (laughs) It does not disqualify you. You with me? God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. He qualifies the called, and he has a call on your life. He has a purpose for you. He's got something he wants to do in your life. Listen, some of you need to hear this today. He can get you where he wants, even where you are today. Where you are today is not a limiting factor to where God wants to take you in your life. Some of you, maybe you dread the holidays because you dread some of those holiday parties and what people are going to say about you and think about you and labels that they're going to put on you. And I would just say, don't put on those labels because God never does. God calls you loved, redeemed, restored, 
anointed, called, purposeful. He has a plan for your life. Don't limit your future capacity based on your past. Number two, don't limit others based on their worst moments. <laughs> Just like we don't want to be put in the box of the, the worst moments of our lives, the mistakes that we made, don't do that for others as well. God isn't done writing their story. It reminds me of the baseball player uh, Bill Buckner. Some of you are baseball fans. You know, you know that name. What most of us don't know about Bill Buckner is he was actually a very good player. He not only made it to the big leagues, but he had a great career. He had uh, more hits than guys like Joe DiMaggio and Ted Williams, names that if you know baseball, you, you certainly will you know. One year he even had the batting title. He was the best hitter in all of baseball. He was a great teammate. He was a great leader in the clubhouse. But most people know Bill Buckner, and probably if you do know him, the first thing that came into your mind is one horrible mistake that he made in the 1986 World Series when he was playing for the Boston Red Sox. He went down late in the game to get a slow roller. It went between his legs, and eventually the other team won, and everybody said it was Bill Buckner's fault. How could he miss that ground ball? The Boston Red Sox fans, as you can imagine, are incredibly kind people, right? They never let him live it down. In fact, he died earlier this year, and most of the stories that were talking about him whenever he passed away, the first line in the story talked about that one mistake back in 1986. Nobody was talking about his illustrious career before and after, or what he even did once he was finished playing a game. <laughs> they just talked about that one mistake. And can, can we just be honest for a moment? That's often what we do to one another. Well, somebody will make a mistake, we'll remember them for their worst moment, or we'll keep replaying and rehashing. We don't want it to happen to us. We don't want to be reminded of our worst moment, but that's often what we'll do for others. And what I want to encourage us to do this holiday season is to start letting people go. Let them be free from their past and start encouraging them. It, it reminds me of the story of Mark in the Bible. In Acts chapter 15, there's uh, the Apostle Paul and Barnabas, and they were working together, and Barnabas wants to bring along this young man named Mark, and Paul is just, he's a wholeheartedly against it. Don't bring that guy. He's abandoned us once before. We're not bringing him along. But Barnabas sees potential. He sees hope. He sees uh, that there's a, a, he's got a call on his life. And so Paul leaves, and he gets another guy, and Barnabas leaves, and he takes Mark with him. Fast forward years later, Paul's writing a letter to his, another protege called Timothy, and he says, go and get Mark, because Mark is incredibly useful to me. Well, how in the world did he go from being useless to useful? there was a guy named Barnabas who kept believing in him, even after he made the mistake. Don't, don't limit others based on their past mistakes. What if we were to encourage them and be a part of where they're going? In time, you probably know this, Mark becomes the author of the Gospel of Mark. And Christian history rem remembers him whenever they symbolize him in, in various churches and in, in different ways. They symbolize him as a lion. The Gospel of Mark as a, as a lion. In time, this guy that for a moment in time was thought in the, the mind of Apostle Paul as a coward ends up becoming a lion, and in time, he's martyred for his faith. He becomes a champion, a hero that we look back on and learn from. Do not write people off. God's not done writing their story. Be, be a champion this holiday season. Believe the best in them. Believe the best for them, just as you hope others are believing the best. For you. Number three, write this down. Don't judge the future based on where you are today. Don't judge the future based on where you are today. I think many people have a hard time believing God for the future based on where they are in the present. They look around and they think, I should be further along. Uh, at my age, I should have accomplished more than this. Why didn't that business venture work out? Why can't I seem to get relationships right? And listen, for sure, there are times that our decisions create detours in God's plan. But listen, not every desert season is a negative event. Are you with me? It just always feels that way. <laughs> it feels like it's a negative thing. We assume it's either a punishment from God or it's of the devil. But listen, sometimes it's God building something in us in preparation for something else that's coming. He, he, he's building up a greater faith. Remember Jesus. Just before he begins his earthly ministry. Let me show you a verse. When we get to the underlined parts, I want you to say the underlined parts aloud with me. Okay, here we go. And Jesus, say it with me, 
full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. Jesus was walking with God, we know, because it says he was full of the Spirit. He was walking with God. God was with him. And then who is it that leads him out into the desert, into the wilderness? The Spirit of God. God is with him, and then God leads him out into a desert season. Most of us would look at Jesus if we were to see him in the middle of those 40 days, and we'd call him a failure. Man, Jesus had so much potential, and here he is just roaming in the desert. <laughs> Not a mountain to anything, not really doing anything with his life. What's God doing? God's building him. He's preparing him for the earthly ministry, the greatness that's going to come about in the days to come. This desert season, you need to hear this, this desert season was preparation for abundant ministry. You need, you need, to, you need to get that picture in your mind. The desert was preparation for the abundance. That seems backwards, doesn't it? But listen, if you feel like you're walking in the desert now, you need to know that the rains are coming. God has abundance that he wants to bring about in your life. If you'll just, just keep pressing forward, you just keep trusting him, keep walking with him. He's not done. It doesn't matter where you are. You look around and you're disappointed at closed doors, failed ventures. You think that you've missed it. And listen, sometimes God needs to close a door to get you to your destiny. Sometimes God needs to take you on a different path than what you were originally thinking. Stop worrying about what others are saying. Stop worrying about what others are doing. God has a destiny for you. I remember back in the summer of 2008, uh, Katie and I were moving out to Los Angeles. and We thought that at the ripe old age of 27 and 25 that we were finished. <laughs> we, we, we thought God's best days were behind us. We had a, a ministry venture and we, we, we had great plans and great dreams and great hopes, and it really didn't come about like we had expected. And on the outside, it looked like we were fine. We were going out to study at Fuller Theological Seminary, and I was doing a ministry residency at a great church. But I'm just telling you, on the inside, we were crushed. We thought, God, where, where are you? God, can you do anything in us? God, can you do anything through our lives? And I had no idea that just three years later from that summer, that I'd be standing on a stage preaching to multiple campuses to a few thousand people. God was doing a work in me. It was, it was a preparation. I had no idea that six years from that summer we moved to L.A., that I'd be standing on a stage in Deep South, Jackson, Mississippi, and uh, regularly preaching to well over 10,000 people all across the state of Mississippi. I had no idea that God was doing that. All we were doing was kind of driving out there and looking at our windows. Listen, wherever you are today, don't just write it off. I can't get to where God wants me to go based on where I am today. No, no. God's just beginning. He's just getting started of what he wants to do in and through your life. You thought God was finished, and he's actually been working behind the scenes. He's doing more behind the scenes than you could ever do in, in visibility. It wasn't the enemy stopping you. It was actually the Spirit preparing you. Think about it. When Jesus is hanging on a cross, he's murdered, he's dead, he's placed into a borrowed tomb. Can you imagine what people were thinking? Who was this bum? Like, we thought he was a prophet. We thought he was going to amount to greatness. And now he's just been murdered and killed and thrown aside. His life was for nothing. And people had no idea that in three days he was going to not only rise from the dead, but he was going to change destinies for billions of people. What was God doing? He was just preparing. There was a waiting. There was a process. There was a preparation of what God was doing. Listen to me. Don't judge the future based on where you are today. God is just beginning to write your story. Here's the fourth and final thing. Believe that God doesn't define you by your past, but that he refines you in the journey. Believe that God does not define you by your past. No, no, he's refining you in the journey. God will never say you are what you did. He'll never put you in the box of your greatest failure or your biggest mistake. No, no, God displays his power most fully when you trust him with your worst moments. Think about that for a moment. God displays his work most fully, most powerfully, when you will trust him with your worst moments. You, you, just, you just bring him to him and see what he can do. What the enemy meant for evil, what the world calls broken, God sees a masterpiece in the making. He's just getting started with your life. Let's go back to Peter for just a moment before we finish up. When Peter was passionately abandoning everything to follow Jesus, 
one day Jesus says, who, Peter, who do you say that I am? Who do you, who do you think I am? And Peter says, you're, you're, you're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. And Jesus looks at him and says, on that confession of faith, I'm going to build my whole church. Can you imagine a celebration among the disciples? Right, Peter, you got it right. What a wonderful moment. They're high-fiving and they're celebrating. Man, this guy, like, he's got it. He's, he's staying close to Jesus. Can you imagine the juxtaposition in Peter's soul? And Jesus looks up at him. He's denied Jesus. And he goes out and he says, and he weeps bitterly. I kind of think Peter might have been replaying that moment in his, in his mind as he was weeping. There was a day when Jesus looked at me, the one I believe is the Son of God, and he looked at me and said, I'm going to build my church on your confession. And now I'm out here weeping bitterly, and I just feel like a backstabbing coward. Whatever happened to the Peter that was going to build the church? And now I'm out here doing this. But remember, God doesn't define us by our past mistakes, our worst moments. He's refining us in the journey. Days later, when the women go to the tomb to prepare Jesus for his final burial, they show up and there's an angel, and the angel says, he's not here. <laughs> he hasn't moved, he's been, he's been resurrected, he's, he's, he's risen from the dead. And the angel says, says this, he says, go and tell the disciples and Peter. Think about that for a moment. Of all the people in the world that God could have chosen to, to say, make sure they know that Jesus is resurrected from the dead, he says, go tell all the disciples and Peter. Why? He wasn't finished writing his story. He didn't want to be defined by his worst moment. In fact, soon thereafter, Peter and all the other guys, they're out fishing in a boat. And Jesus comes walking on the shore one day, and you got to love Peter. He doesn't wait for the boat to make it back to shore to get to Jesus. He just jumps out of the boat, and he swims to get to Jesus. And I don't know if you can imagine that first conversation. It could, could have been a little awkward. <laughs> and then they're sitting around, and they're, they're eating fish, and there's a fire going, and Jesus looks at Peter and he says, hey, Peter, do you, do you love me? And Peter says, Lord, you know all things. You, you know that I love you. And then Jesus asks it again. He says, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, Jesus, you know everything. You know, you know that I love you. And then he asks it a third time. It's getting real awkward. Peter, do you love me? And it says at this that, that Peter's heart sank. Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And yet you ask me a third time, you know that I love you. Now, what in the world is Jesus doing in this moment? Like, is Jesus, like, self-conscious, right? Like, he just needs to know, does this guy love me? Like, is, is Peter, like, is he for me? Is he behind me? He's, he's, he's like, I, I know he denied me, and I just, I just got to seal it in my heart before I go to heaven. You know, I am a son of God, but I just kind of got to. That would be ridiculous, wouldn't it? Jesus knew that Peter loved him even when he was looking him in the eye and denying him. He was never going to define him by his worst moment. When he looked up and saw him, Peter was like, I don't know this guy. He knew in that moment that Peter loved him. He was just afraid. Jesus was about to be killed. Peter didn't want to be killed. He was having a bad moment. What's, what's Jesus doing? He's restoring Peter to full faith. You denied me three times, and now I'm giving you the opportunity in front of everybody to say, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Three times to bring him into full restoration. Fast forward several weeks later. The disciples, Peter, they're all praying in an upper room, and it says that as they're praying, the Holy Spirit comes and descends on all of Jerusalem, and people are speaking in foreign languages that they didn't know how to speak, and it's just the place has turned into to craziness, and they don't know what to do. What do you do when God shows up unexpectedly in your life, right? And the disciples will look at one another like, somebody's got to talk, like somebody needs to speak to the crowd, like something, something needs to be done. And you can imagine the moment when they're like, well, who, who, who is it? Who should speak? And they say, Peter. Like, Peter's the best one. Like, he, he should be the one to speak. And can you imagine what's happening in Peter's heart? You, you mean you want me, the guy that just a few weeks ago denied Jesus in front of these people, you want me now to go and stand in front of them and speak to them and tell them about this Jesus? They're like, yeah, like, you're the best one to do it. Not just necessarily because he was the best speaker. Maybe he was. But because these are the people that just crucified Jesus. You need to go and tell them that there's forgiveness. You need to go and tell them there's love. You need to go and tell them there's grace. Yeah, they, they killed the Son of God, but, but he still forgives them. He still loves them. Who better, Peter, to tell them that than the one who denied them? 
It's you. You, you need to be. And, and it says that Peter stepped forward in full confidence and full faith. It says that he shouted to the crowd. And 3,000, 3,000 people that day, in that moment, gave their lives to Jesus. Now imagine if Peter just stayed in that moment of weeping bitterly, he never comes back around to faith. See, a lot of us have had those weeping bitterly moments, right? Something happened. We did something. Somebody did something to us, and we never get past our past. If Peter had stayed in that moment, he would have never become the leader in the church that he was. 3,000 people that day, their lives would have not been touched, and God wanted to use him to show us today that he does not define you by your worst mistakes. He defines you in the journey because he's not done with you. And maybe for some of you today, you need to ask yourself the question, what weight from your past do you need to stop carrying? Everywhere you go, you're just lugging all this stuff around from the, how you've been hurt, and how you've hurt others, and decisions you've made and failures and frustrations and you just kind of keep walking around with all of it and it's holding you back from your present and your future. And maybe today's the day that you've stopped defining yourself by your mistakes because God doesn't. Maybe today's the day you let somebody else go free and find actually when you let them go, you're the one that needs to go free because you're not holding on to the bitterness. You're not holding on to the anger and the hurt and replaying it. Now, this holiday, you're going to let somebody go free. You're going to forgive them. Well, what, what is forgiveness? You're just giving away to somebody else what God's already given to you. Maybe this is the, the season where you'll start to believe again that God has a future and a destiny and a plan for you. That he's refining you in the journey. Maybe today's the day you forgive yourself because God already has. You let yourself go free. You walk out of here today traveling light full of hope and full of promise and full of faith that God loves you and he's not even close to being done with your story. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you so much that you are such a good and gracious Father. You are such a kind God. You could have turned your back on us, but it would have been against everything that you stand for. You're a God of new beginnings. You're a God of hope. You're a God of irrevocable callings. God, today we bring our hurts and our wounds to you. As we pray today, I want to pray for a couple of groups of people. The first I'd love to pray for, just with our eyes still closed for a moment. Maybe you're here today and you are a follower of Jesus, but if you're being honest, you've been carrying around some weight. You've been carrying around some baggage from the past and the hurts and the failures and the mistakes. And today is your day to start traveling light experience the grace that God has for you. If you're here today, you say, I, I need to let some of that go. In just a moment, I'm going to invite you to raise your hand. Maybe it's some hurts from your past that you've created. Maybe it's others that have brought it into your life. Maybe you, you thought your future was all but, but gone. Your dreams were shattered and you discovered today, no, 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 God still has a plan for me. If that's you today, I just want to invite you just to raise your hand up high. Just raise it up. You've got some past, some weight, some baggage you need to drop behind. It's wonderful. Anybody else? find some freedom today. Just put your hands down, and if that's you, you don't have to pray out loud, but just in your own heart, would you say something like this, Lord, thank you that you love me so much that you'll let me go free. God, that you'll invite me to travel light. That my past hurts, habits, and hang-ups, they don't define my future. No, you've got something for me. You've got promise, and you've got hope. Whatever hurts you've been carrying around, I, I want to invite you just right now just to tell God, Lord, I'm giving that to you. Whatever it is, that person you need to forgive, that decision you made that you keep hanging over yourself, just, just to give it to God. That hope that you had that hasn't yet come about, would you say, Lord, I'm trusting you with it? God, we know that when we bring our burdens to you, Lord, you receive them and you give us back new beginnings, fresh starts. You put wind in our sails. You bring faith and hope and encouragement. We're leaning into you today. As we continue to pray, just for a moment, I want to encourage you. Maybe you're here today and you're not yet a follower of Jesus, but you'd like to be. 
Or maybe at one point in your past, you had made a decision and you kind of walked away from it. Whatever it might be, you know today is your day. You want to begin walking with Jesus. You want to receive the grace that he has for your life. You want to receive the hope that he has for you. You believe that he died on the cross for your sins to give you a new beginning. That he rose up from the dead so that you could have new life. If that's you, today you want to walk out of here 100% brand new. No longer carrying your past. In just a moment, I'm going to invite you to raise your hands. On the count of three, I'm just going to say raise them up. Your eyes closed. This is an opportunity for you to tell God, Lord, today is my day. I need your grace. I need your forgiveness. I need set free. If that's you, on the count of three, one, two, three. Just raise your hand up as high as you can. Anybody else? That's wonderful. You can put your hand down. Anybody else before we pray? If that's you, would you just pray this with me? This prayer in your heart, would you say, Lord, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I've just done that. Thank you for rising up from the dead to give me new life. And today, I'm leaning into you. I'm receiving your grace. You are my Lord. You are my God. You are my Savior. And I believe from this day forward, you'll give me the strength I need to follow you with reckless abandon. Father, for all of us, we say thank you. What a great and kind God you are. Lord, we worship you from the bottom of our hearts. Lord, with all that we know, we thank you. That we don't have to carry around the weight of our past. We get to walk free today. And it's not because of anything we've done, but it's all because of Jesus. We just celebrate you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, listen, we love to celebrate life change around here. For those who are leaving some way behind, discovering the grace of Jesus today, come on, let's put our hands together and celebrate that. Come on.